Good morning. Welcome everybody. Why do I feel lower than normal today? <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, maybe I just need to move myself around a little bit and shed a bit of light on the subject. It's very dark in the mornings at 7 now in Cape Town. It's the only thing that I I don't mind the winter at all. I was born in the middle of winter. I'm a winter baby and so I um, I don't mind the winter. I actually love winter. But um, the, the dark mornings are something else. Good morning my joyful Jolene friend. I did get your message and I do have um, an answer for you so I will message you after the live, let me just get myself situated here. Yeah. Uh, good morning, terrific Tamsin. Good morning, special Simone. Welcome, significant Seb's friend. Good morning, my beautiful Brigitte friend. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, terrific Tishka. Good, good, good golly. <laughs> good morning, Radiant Renee. Welcome, courageous Cole. So good to see you all. Amazing Anthea, special Sylvia. <gasps> Tremendous Tilly, beautiful both of my goodness, the names fly up some mornings and some mornings they creep up like a snail. Good morning, wonderful Wendy. It is so good to have you all on this morning. Um, welcome, welcome. Um, <coughs> I think my voice is a bit croaky, probably because it's first thing in the morning and also because we had a prophetic school last night. Good morning, joyful Jen. I'm super proud of all my prophetic school people um, to see them on the live this morning. Good morning, nurturing Nolene, welcome. I'm super proud of, of my prophetic school people, yes, to see them all on the live this morning. Because uh, Good morning, famous Chantel. Because uh, last night was absolutely amazing. It was really, really incredible. Good morning, my special Sonia daughter. I can't wait to see you either. And it's one more sleep, ladies and gentlemen. One more sleep. And then it's the book launch. So tomorrow morning at Life Church in Somerset West from uh, registration opens at 9 and the event starts at 10. And oh my word, it is going to be amazing. God has been laying so many things on my heart for tomorrow, apart from the fact that he has said that he will be giving out mandates and assignments. And um, so please book your tickets. There is still space. Go on to Quicket. Type in Sally Goodwin, the launch will come up. Book your tickets. Good morning, amazing Anisha. Book your tickets for the book launch. I literally have ladies who have messaged me saying that they, good morning, heroic Hilda. Um, I have, good morning, courageous Claudia. Amen, yes, we take a seat. Good morning, radiant Ross. The day is finally here, said so one more sleep. Um, and um, I've, had, I've had ladies who've messaged me and said that they're going to. Good morning, Conrad, my friend. So good to see you on the live. That they are going to be buying tickets first thing in the morning. <laughs> because some people get paid tomorrow being the 25th. And the Quicket is open until tomorrow morning. Good morning, Stu. Good to see you. Um, so uh, the Quicket is open until tomorrow morning. And so, I mean, up until, including tomorrow morning. So um, I've had ladies who've messaged me and said that tomorrow morning they're going to wake up. Good morning, Estralita, my lovely. Tomorrow morning they're going to wake up and, um, and book their ticket first thing. <laughs> the moment their salary hits their bank account, they're going to be booking their ticket and then coming through to the event. So if you are also in that position, good morning, Julie, my lovely, if you are in that position, then please feel free to um, book your tickets um, tomorrow morning and come on in. So, yes, good morning, Mama Tessa, my lovely. So, and I'm so looking forward to seeing 
some of my spiritual daughters that I don't get to see on a regular basis because they live a bit far away, like my special Sonia and my gorgeous Simone, and um, I'm really excited to see them. So good morning, amazing Amy from the UK. I'm counting down the sleeps to come and see you, my friend. I'm going to send you my dates. Pray for the visas to come through without issue, please. So um, it is good morning, lovely Lindy. Amen, Hilda. Amen, my friend. So it is beautiful Brenda's birthday today. Beautiful Brenda, our amazing friend. <laughs> yes, Estranita. Good morning, Radiant Renil. We're so good to see you. Please like and share, ladies and gentlemen. I always forget to say that until I see my beautiful Bertha friends comment. Good morning, special Sylvia. I know exactly what you mean, Estralita. Also, I feel like I really partied hard last night. <laughs> and I'm kind of, oh, here I am. <laughs> Good morning, incredible Anthea. Lovely to see you. Okay, so it is beautiful Brenda's birthday today. Our beautiful Brenda, who has just recently had spinal surgery and made the most incredible recovery. Uh, to thank you, Jesus, because it is only due to Jesus. And it is definitely only due to Jesus. But it is also the prayers of this community. The prayers of this community that 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 basically brought Brenda, you know, through as well. So it's absolutely only Jesus. But morning, magnificent Marta. But it is also the prayers of this community, the prayers of this family for Brenda that carried her through, and obviously many other people who were praying for her. But um, but this church without walls, this family, this praying community is honestly incredibly powerful. So this morning, particularly for my prophetic school people, I would love for you to pop prophetic words for Brenda into the comments, please. It particularly my prophetic school people, I have an expectation I'm going to be checking <laughs> that you actually did give Brenda a prophetic word. And then those of you who don't get to put it on the comments, but you can reach out to Brenda personally, please feel free to do that as well. But beautiful Brenda is very much deserving of prophetic words today for her birthday. So let us make sure that she receives those prophetic words. Good morning, Nalutandu. This is indeed the day the Lord has made, and we will be glad in it, will we not? Amen and amen. And uh, so... The other, the other person that I would love for you all to pray for is if we could please just pray for beautiful Brigitte. Um, she is a stalwart member of this community. She has been a part of this community almost since right from the beginning since I met her in Harrysmith, basically. She is in Harrysmith. Um, so she um, she's a bit far away and she can't get here for the book launches and things like that. But if we can please just be praying for Brigitte and for her family. Her husband works for the council in Harrysmith and... Um, it is not particularly well run uh, in terms of salaries. And so what happens is their salaries are not paid out when they should be. They are delayed and then they sit in a space where they do not actually know when they're going to be paid. And Brenda herself, ah, Brenda, Brid Bridget herself is in a place where she's just looking for a bit of direction and clarity. So let's just pray for those two ladies right now. So beautiful Brenda friend. And I have said this before, but I'm going to prophesy this over you again for your birthday. So, Lord God, we just bring our beautiful, faithful, stalwart Brenda friend before you this morning on her special day, on her on the anniversary of the day that she entered into the earth realm. And Lord God, you knew that it was the day that she was entering into the earth realm before you even founded the earth and the angels celebrated and trumpets blew in heaven when Brenda was born because you knew the significance of her life, you knew the significance of the path that she would walk, you knew the trials and tribulations that she would walk through and the understanding and the revelation that those trials and tribulations would give her Lord God. You knew all of that and you know what she has been through but my beautiful Brenda friend I just prophesy over you what I saw when you originally 
injured your spine and I felt as though the enemy was literally trying to derail you because it is your season. It is your season of, of elevation. It is your season of acceleration. It is your season to go from glory to glory and from strength to strength. And so I saw the Lord literally putting this this spine of steel inside of your body, a spine of steel that you would stand up straight and not earthly steel, so not a spine of such steel that you can't bend or move or be flexible, but a spine of such steel that you will be able to surge forward with this power in your back that nothing will be able to break you. Nothing will be able to, to make you bend over or like the woman who had been, you know, bent over for 18 years because of everything, because of the demonic and because of what she had walked through. Nothing like that. Nothing will be able to bow you. You will only bow your knee to Jesus. There will be nothing else in your life that will make you feel like you are going to break or you are going to bend or you are going to, you know, in a bad way. You will be flexible and able to move and flow with the spirit as you always are, but you will have this, this, you know, like it says in the word of forehead, of, you know, set your forehead like flint. Well, I feel as though it's going to be your forehead like flint and the same for your spine, the spine of steel, this uprightness, this the strength in your body, the strength inside of you that you just are actually blown away by yourself. Strength like you have never actually encountered before. So I just release that over you, my friend, and also just that you are going from glory to glory. And it might not look like it, but God's idea of going from glory to glory looks very different often to our idea of going from glory to glory. You are going from glory to glory and from strength to strength, my friend, in the name of Jesus. And may you have the most blessed birthday and may you just be so highly favored for the year ahead. Good morning, Jacob. I hope you got the link that I sent you with the interview. And um, it's absolutely, you're not late. <laughs> We're still engaging in community time. And then, Lord God, we just bring Bridgette and her family before you right now. We know, Lord God, that you are our provider. You are Jehovah Jireh. And even though in the natural we rely on salaries and things like that um, for finance, ultimately our source is not our salaries. Our source is not our jobs. Our source is not where the income enters the bank account. Our source is you, Lord God. You are our source. And you bring, you bring, you bring the, the finances and the provision in that we need. And you are more than capable of that. And so we just release an encounter with you as Jehovah Jireh, as Yahweh Jireh, over Bridgette and her family, Lord God. And we also pray in the prophetic school last night, Bridgette, we spoke about how in the atmosphere at the moment, there is a lot of, um, and this is in our nation particularly right now, probably because we're very close to elections, there is a lot of defeat, a lot of despondency, a lot of despair, um, a lot of, you know, all these emotions and things that are in the air because of where we are as a nation and because of the elections that we are facing and because of how people feel about who is there to be elected and who's actually worthwhile to be elected, etc., etc. And so, beautiful Bridgette friend, right now, I just release an encounter with the Lord over you that you would be able to ask God how much of what you're feeling is yours and how much is what is in the air and not yours to hold on to. Yours to pray into for sure, but not yours to hold on to. So I just release wisdom over you now, Bridgette. I release revelation over you now. I release direction over you now. I release clarity over you now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that God will come through for you. And so very quickly, good morning, Robin, my lovely. So good to have you on the live here in South Africa. What a treat. Yay, yay. And welcome, Joe Allison. It's so good to have you on, my gorgeous friend, as well. And Nolene, we will pray for your friend. We just uh, speak over... Uh, um, uh, Nolene's friend right now, sorry, in the name of Jesus, that the second interview that she goes for today 
will go well and God's will will be done in this situation, that God's will will be done in this situation and that what God has that is best for her will be what is her portion. So, and I'm so glad Dion is better, Hanali. I'm so, so glad. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we are a community, we are a family, we are a church without walls and it's such a privilege and that is why we take the time to pray for each other and be here for each other. Good morning lovely Louise, I wish you could be there my angel. My lovely Louise friend is from New Zealand, my gorgeous Amy friend and Jacob are from the UK and I would love with all my heart for them to actually be able to be at the book launch but one day, one day, one day I will be doing book launches in New Zealand and in the UK, in, in Jesus' name I pray, <laughs> in Jesus' name I pray. And I'm going to bring some books to the UK, my Amy friend, um, for you. So uh, yes, um, I'm going to have to maybe ask for extra weight <laughs> on the plane. <laughs> mm. So welcome, welcome everybody who's joining. Please, before we move on to the word, don't forget the... Um, the book launch tomorrow. Don't forget the book launch tomorrow and um, book your tickets. If you haven't booked your ticket yet, book your tickets. Good morning, special Sunette. Your tickets must be booked on Quicket, <laughs> please. Even if you book them like as you're standing in the car park, book your tickets on Quicket, please. And so, yes, so let's just all, I can't wait to just get together as a community tomorrow. And, you know, my prayer is just that the people who need to be there will be there. That is actually um, all I want. And, um, and we are going to worship. We are going to praise the Lord. We are going to sing. My voice is going to be 100% because last night we were singing this, this song last night. I don't know how many of you have heard it. It's a song by Torin Wells and it is um, called Take It All Back. And it's, a, it's the kind of music or the kind of song that probably a younger generation listened to. But I was super impressed, particularly when I said something a little bit... Um, what is the word, a little bit cheeky about bringing people into the 21st century and Mama Tessa corrected me immediately and said that I would be surprised by the music that she listens to and she was singing the loudest of all in that space last night. But I have the smallest, softest speaker that you've ever seen. I'm going to get a bigger, louder one because worship needs to happen. And um, and so I was literally standing in the middle of this group of people and I, I cannot sing. So let me just get that straight. I'm not a worship leader, singer person. And I was holding the speaker up so that everyone could hear the song because lots of people didn't know it. And I was singing at the top of my voice so that people could pick up the words and this and somebody said to me, Oh Sally, now you're gonna to need to be speaking on Saturday and this morning literally my voice is croaky because I was like singing the words so loudly because it goes the chorus goes and I'm not gonna sing on Facebook Live, but the chorus goes, um, I'm calling the angels down. I'm calling what how does it go? I'm calling the angels down, I'm storming the gates of hell. Um <laughs> something something I'm taking back what the enemy stole I can't now I, we sang the chorus so many times last night and now I can't remember the words but it's absolutely thank you beautiful both I will but it's absolutely phenomenal it's such a phenomenal song and if you feel like a song to get your blood going you know and to get the warrior inside of you kind of rising up and you know it's very catchy and it's very much take it back what the enemy stole you know you just want to actually like go out there and storm the gates of hell so we were we were shouting <laughs> that song last night it was hilarious honestly I, we laughed so much last night we really did and that's prophetic school when you when you found your tribe, you know, because it's not just a prophetic school of random people. It is a tribe, and um, and many of you have found your your tribe here. So yes, <laughs> yes, that's what I need a boombox, Tishka. Oh, my beautiful Louise friend, that would be amazing. The land of the long white cloud. Wow, that's incredible. And there's definitely prophetic symbolism in there. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let us go on to what it is that God has for us this morning. So we were speaking 
on Wednesday um, from Mark chapter 11, verse 17 and 18. We were speaking about how when Jesus tipped over the tables, and please, if you haven't watched Wednesday's um, program, please go and watch it. Um, did I say good morning? Activate her with Sally Goodwin and Friday feasts earlier. Um, I went to bed very, very late. <laughs> so my brain is a little bit tired. We totally Holy Spirit fueled this morning. Um, so it's Friday feast and we are going to feast on what God has for us. So on Wednesdays, we, um, we spoke about this where Jesus tipped over the tables, but the verses in Mark specifically speak about how it wasn't just the money sellers. It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't just the money lenders and the people selling doves and things like that, where Jesus tipped over the tables. It was also people who took a shortcut through the temple enclosure to get to wherever they needed to be carrying their household appliances and their worldly goods and all of that sort of thing and we spoke about how um, in in be believers today or in some church and ministry spaces today we think we can take a shortcut to the glory of God um, with through the Holy Spirit we think the Holy Spirit is like a shortcut to the glory and we treat the Holy Spirit like he's a switch that we can switch on and switch off and that you know and he must manifest himself the way we think he should manifest himself you know um we, we we don't simply want him to just manifest himself the way god wills him to manifest himself we we think he should manifest himself the way we have seen him manifest before and the way we would like him to manifest and in the ways that we assume make a gathering a more spiritual or spiritual or uh, anointed you know because we have particularly those of us who have spent a lot of time in charismatic um pentecostal revivalist type church or ministry spaces we have an idea of what it should look like when the holy spirit manifests himself and there's nothing wrong with those manifestations that is not what i'm saying but what i'm saying is that when that is always our expectation when we want to flip the switch of the holy spirit and that's what we expect him to do and then he doesn't do that because god is wanting to come through in a different way and then because that doesn't happen at a meeting we're like oh no those people aren't anointed or that wasn't very spiritual because there was no, you know, rolling around or um, or laughing uncontrollably or, you know, and and we're in a, a, a we're in an era because the word season, I get tired of it, but I can't think of anything else. And um, we're in a space, should I say, in time where um, it is more a case of the Holy Spirit coming upon us where we weep and not weep in a sad, grieved, like I'm so devastated way, but weep because of the presence of the Lord, because of the weighty presence of God. And that is exactly what happened on Wednesday. I didn't weep, but as I, as I repeated that verse, um, as I read that verse over and over to you, that verse from Mark 11, verse 17 and 18, as I read those verses, over and over to you and the vote let me just read it one more time today before we move on to the other but the verse where he said where jesus says to the people is it not written my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations and mark just writes it differently to the other gospels he includes a bit more detail and Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. And as I said that, and even as I repeat it now, I felt this presence, this weighty presence d descend on me and like and descend onto my shoulders it was this weighty and i actually sat here for a minute or two and i i wasn't even sure whether i should go on i thought should i just stop there you know because should we just sit in that with the weightiness of that presence it wasn't a heaviness you know it wasn't a heaviness it was a weightiness just this this weightiness of the presence of god on my shoulders and this um, the sense of almost, I felt almost like he was um, 
giving me a mantle. I felt almost like there was a cloak uh, being put on me and I can still feel it. I still feel it. And it's it's literally carried me through these, these couple of days because there is just a sense of well, the way God is moving and that he is establishing on the earth his house of prayer for all nations in each of us individually and corporately and corporately not a man-made house of prayer where you know there are leaders that are glorified or um you know um individuals that are put on pedestals and seen as you know especially supernaturally or spiritually gifted but a house of prayer through people like you and i ordinary people who become who become who are because we are his temple that's what it tells us in scripture but we actually become a house of prayer for for all the nations and then as we come together we build this out of the remnant that is rising up around the earth we build this house of prayer that is god's structure and god's structure alone and a house of prayer also you know when we say a house of prayer and we think about it in terms of the temple i think many of us assume that then it just means a whole lot of people who spend all their time on their knees but that is not people came to the temple yes for prayer yes for teaching yes for worship but also to encounter god if you are if you have have a history with the Lord and a relationship with the Lord where you have allowed him to use your temple to build a house of prayer for all the nations. Then when people come into contact with you, they will encounter God. That was the t that was what the temple space was for back in ancient Israel Israeli days. You know, the temple space was the place where people came to encounter God, to receive in all the ways that we know to receive receive but to encounter God and it should be that where people are where you are and um, if you're a house of prayer for all the nations then it shouldn't matter what nation a person comes from what color a person is what wherever they are from and whatever you know but that they when they encounter you without you having to say a word or do a thing they encounter god because you are carrying that house of prayer with you and just imagine a group of people a community of people a tribe of people all walking in that anointing and 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 because why because we have consecrated ourselves because we are living righteous holy pure lives because we are walking in radical obedience that is how you establish a house of prayer that is for all the nations thank you so much my beautiful brenda friend so my gorgeous brenda friend has put the link to buy the tickets to the book launch in the comments she has put the link to the song by torin wells in the comments she's amazing i still haven't figured out how to do those things she is amazing so thank you my beautiful friend on your birthday and you administrating so hard mm. so when jesus said those words when jesus spoke those words he was actually he was because he what did he say is it not written so there are two verses in the old testament that um scholars and theologians feel that jesus was referring to when he said those words is it not written and the two verses in scripture in the old testament particularly that he that he feels that scholars feel that he was referring to and the first verse that we're going to look at is isaiah chapter 56 isaiah chapter 56 and it is verse 7 isaiah 56 verse 7 which says all these and just listen to these words ladies and gentlemen because they are so powerful all these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. And once again, 
I want you to understand because so many people feel that the Old Testament was just about Israel. It was just about Israel, it was just for Israel, and that God only started paying attention to the Gentile nations once Jesus came. And that is not true. That is not true. God's attention and God's plan and God's love and God's purpose for the Gentile nations is right through the Old Testament, from Genesis right through to the end, right through to Malachi. God's God's intentions for the Gentile nations who were worshipping false gods and not him, God's intentions for them are right there. Because here again in Isaiah, he specifically says, My house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. At a time when the house of prayer, as the Israelites knew it, was only for the Jewish people. And a Gentile could not enter into the temple. A Gentile could not enter into that sacred space unless they had converted to Judaism and become a part of the Jewish people and a part of Israel in that way. But right from the Old Testament, God is already laying out because he is not only speaking about the physical temple, he's speaking about us as his temples and he's speaking about the corporate body together that will be a house of prayer for all peoples. That is what he is speaking about. And Isaiah 56 is actually an amazing chapter. Because God speaks about how, in Isaiah chapter 56, verse 1, God says, Keep justice. Keep justice. Do and use righteousness. And in the Amplified, it says, Conformity to the will of God, which brings salvation. For my salvation is soon to come, and my righteousness, my rightness and justice to be revealed. Blessed. Happy and fortunate is the man who does this and the son of man who lays hold of it and binds himself fast to it, who keeps sacred the Sabbath so as not to profane it and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner, let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord. Do you notice that God says here, let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord. He doesn't say the foreigner who has joined himself to Israel. He says, let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. Because a eunuch obviously could not produce in the natural, natural fruit. So the eunuchs could say, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just a dry tree. Thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose the things which please me and hold firmly my covenant. To them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better and more enduring than sons and daughters. And to the foreigners who join themselves and love the name of the Lord, so as not to put who hold fast. Sorry, I've done, I've, I'm, we're going to run out of time if I read the whole chapter. All these. So when God says, all these I will bring to my holy mountain, he's not saying all the Jewish people. Because he's just spoken about the foreigner, the non-Jew, and the eunuch. The person whose life circumstances and situation could potentially disqualify them from being drawn to the house of prayer, from being taken to God's holy mountain. God specifically refers to the foreigner and to the eunuch, to the people who feel that they are disqualified from what God is doing or from what God intends to do. So he speaks about people who love justice, who love righteousness, who walk in obedience and how he's going to draw them together. And then immediately, because he knows that there are people who will be thinking, I do not qualify for that. He immediately qualifies it by saying the foreigner and the eunuch. And only after speaking about the foreigner and the eunuch who believe in the Lord and do the things God has called them to do, then he says all these. 
I will bring to my holy mountain. All these. So the Jewish people and the foreigners who believe in me and the eunuchs who believe in me, all the people who feel that they are disqualified, but they believe in me and who I am, all these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. So never mind feeling disqualified, never mind feeling left out, never mind feeling any of those things. They will be joyful in my house of prayer. They won't come sliding in, you know, or come through the back door or slide in the side door and kind of, you know, take a seat right at the back and not partake in what was in what is happening. No. All these I will bring to my holy mountain and I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. They all will have access. They all will have access. Access to the holy mountain. Access to the house of prayer. This is not only speaking about the Israelites. This is speaking about all of us. All of us who believe in God, all of us who walk lives of holiness and righteousness and purity and radical obedience, all of us. And then in verse 8, thus says the Lord God, and now you must understand that when Jesus spoke these verses, when Jesus said, it is written, he would have only, he only spoke one verse out, but everybody around him in the temple would have known which chapter in the Torah, because they learned the Torah, they learned the Torah, so they would have known what he was referring to, what chapter in Isaiah he was referring to, what he was talking about when he said that, they would have known exactly what he was saying. They would have been able to take from that one verse where he said, is it not written? And been able to extrapolate what else was in that chapter. That's why, one of the reasons why, the Jewish leaders and the chief priests and people like that hated him so much because they took their all the identity, everything from being Jewish and from being Israel, God's chosen nation. And they felt as though no matter how they behaved, no matter what they did, they would always be the only chosen ones. But God is saying to them in chapters like this, no, no, yes, you are my chosen people and you will always be my chosen people. But I have a whole lot of other people that I need to draw to me. And so he says in verse 8, God says, Thus says the Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather yet others to Israel besides those already gathered. Because in verse 10, it says Israel's watchmen are blind. And then it speaks about how the dogs are greedy and the shepherds don't understand and all of those kinds of things. And this is why he is bringing all the other people in as well. So when Jesus spoke those words, he was saying so much more than just, um, you guys are using this temple for the wrong reasons and you are, and it's supposed to be a house of prayer and what, what are you doing here? You know, get out, go do your thing, something else. You, you know, it, he was saying so much more than that and we get the layers and the depth of what he was saying when we read the scripture in Mark because of the detail that Mark adds. So again, just another reason to read these things carefully pick up the differences it's not that they're four gospels that tell you all different stories and they couldn't agree it's just that different people um it you know they the different details mean something to different people and god made sure that all of those details were captured by the four people who wrote the gospels so that is isaiah 56 verse 7 and the other verse that jesus could have been quoting could have been quoting is is um it was here somewhere hold on one moment while i just find it very very quickly uh my little sticky things aren't sticky anymore i need to use the ones that that hilda gave me um jeremiah chapter 7 verse 11 jeremiah chapter 7 verse 11 and this is jeremiah prophesying prophesying so 
Many scholars and theologians believe that when Jesus used those words, is it not written, he was actually quoting from Isaiah and from Jeremiah, but you'll see why now, and that those, those people who were listening to him would have understood that. They would have understood that. So Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 11 says this, Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? And the Amplified adds this explanation, a place of retreat for you between acts of violence. Behold, I myself have seen it. And this is Jeremiah. Jeremiah is prophesying. He is prophesying. And so if you look at Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 4, Jeremiah says, trust not in the lying words of the false prophets who maintain that God will protect Jerusalem because his temple is there, saying, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. For if you thoroughly amend your ways, etc., etc., if you do not oppress the transient and the alien, the fatherless and the widow, or shed innocent blood, or go after another, after other gods, then I will cause you. So basically, what God is saying to them here is don't think that just because this physical temple is in Jerusalem that I am going to protect it no matter what you do. Because that's not the case because Jesus was coming and he was the actual temple. His body was the actual temple and then he released the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit became the, on the inside of us and made us the actual temple. And then he says here, um, you trust in lying words that cannot benefit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery? Now pay attention to this. Pay attention to this and think of the church today, the man-made religious structure that we call church. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then dare to come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are set free, only to go on with this wickedness and these abominations. That is Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 10. And from there, God goes on to say, has this house which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes, a place of retreat for you between acts of violence. Behold, I myself have seen it, says the Lord. And you know, when I felt that, that, that weightiness descend onto my shoulders on Wednesday, I felt this, that this, these verses, God is calling out his church. He is calling out his church. He is saying, will you, and you know, we read these things and we think, um, oh my goodness, okay, well, I haven't stolen anything recently. You know, I haven't murdered anybody. I haven't committed adultery, you know, as per the 10 commandments. However, if you go and read what Jesus said, when Jesus said, you know, that even if you look at somebody in lust, with lust in your heart, it is as if, you have committed adultery. If you look at somebody with hate in your heart, it is as if you have committed murder. So we read this and we're like, oh, well, I haven't stolen, I haven't murdered. But no, sit and say, okay, Lord, have I ever used something I didn't have permission to use? Have I ever said I hate that person? Have I ever, you know, looked with lust or have I sworn falsely? You know, have I said um, yes to something when actually it was no? Or when someone asked me to cover up for something, have I done that? Have I gone after other gods? Money. You know, we immediately think idols and we think, oh, well, we don't worship idols. We do, just differently. Differently. Have I gone after money, status, position, influence, affluence that is not godly? And then, do we dare to come and stand before God in his house, which is called by his name, and say, we are set free? And then we leave and continue with the same abomination. 
and that. So it is not when Jesus was talking about the money changers and the money lenders and the people selling the doves and he said my house is supposed to be a house of prayer and it has become a den of robbers. He was speaking about so much more, so much more than just what we think. And we think, oh, well, we don't have, you know, people selling doves in our churches. We don't have someone, you know, we don't have that, so we okay. No. Read Jeremiah 7. It applies to the church today. It has probably ap applied to the church in every season the church has walked through for the last 2,000 years. We cannot stand here and say, oh my goodness, well, we actually fine because, you know, those Israelites, they were so bad and they were so naughty and they did all the wrong things. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Have you looked at the log in your own eye recently? Have you gone to church and stood there worshipping the Lord and praising Him for freedom, knowing that there are a whole lot of things that you're doing that He would not be um, proud of? That you are not standing in holiness and righteousness and purity and living a life of radical obedience where you have surrendered all to the Lord and yet you still go and you stand in church and you act as if you have it all together and you're all perfect and you're all wonderful, etc., etc. And you say, I have been set free and you leave on the Sunday afternoon and you go exactly back to the life that you are living that is not of God on the Monday. Have we not all heard stories and, and about people who have done that, who live two separate lives, one a church life and then a normal life? Have we not been those people in some instances where we have, this is why, this is why the thing we need to value, one of the things we need to value above all else in these times is integrity, integrity, People who live what they speak. People who, the words that they speak, that is the life they are living. Not, not words, they don't stand up and speak words and their life looks different. Integrity, integrity, integrity. That what you say and what you do match up. That if you say, I am praying for someone, you are actually praying for them. If you walk past a person and you say, I bless you, you actually mean that. You're not thinking to yourself, oh yes, I bless you, but actually I don't really want the Lord to bless you because you're this or you're that. You know, we are all human. We are not perfect. We, we make mistakes and all that kind of thing. And mistakes, mistakes are different. Mistakes are different, but when we deliberately choose, when we deliberately choose to live lives that are not of God, and we somehow convince ourselves that God is okay with what we are doing, and then we stand in His house, the house called by His name, as if we have got it all, we are all good, we are seeing and hearing and rev getting revelation, etc., and then we leave. And that is why I have said for years now, for years, I have said this. If you go to church on a Sunday morning and encounter God, like encounter Him in ways that are clearly obvious, you know, you shake, you laugh, you weep, you roll around, whatever you do, you get slain in the spirit, whatever that looks like. I have no issue with any of that. I have no issue with any of those things. However, if you go to church every Sunday and you encounter God like that and your life does not change, I question who you're encountering. Are you encountering God? Because if you encounter God to that degree that your body cannot physically withstand the presence of the Lord that is filling you, your life has got to change. You cannot go on with your life normally. Your life has got to change because that sort of encounter with the Lord is life changing. Your life will change. Your family will change. Your community will change. That is why God encounters us. 
And that is what I mean by saying that we, we use the Holy Spirit, we switch him on and switch him off. So we switch him on on Sunday morning so that we can, you know, have all the feels and do all the things and manifest so we can look super spiritual and super anointed and super incredible. And then we switch him off when we leave church because we want the rest of the week to be able to live our lives our way. And people, God is not putting up with that anymore. He is not putting up with that anymore. He doesn't expect us to be perfect. He understands we will make mistakes. But it is when we deliberately make a choice to disobey His word, when we deliberately make a choice to live unrighteously, when we deliberately make a choice, that is when he says, you cannot come to my house called by my name and say, I am free. And then go off and live your life the way you have lived it. Something has got to change. Because if you are going to be the temple of the Lord, if you are the house called by God's name, just imagine that. Think of that. You are the house. Your body is the temple. So you are the house called by God's name. That should make you, that, that, should, that should bring such awe and reverent wonder through, through you and on you and in you that every strand of your DNA should cry out to live the most righteous holy, pure life because you are a house called by God's name. You are not a den of robbers. You are not a den of thieves. And if you can live in that space, that space of awe and reverent wonder that every morning you wake up and you just like this body, this body, this body is a house called by God's name. And you just think to yourself, wow, what a privilege, Lord. What a privilege to occupy a house called by your name and then when we all get together like we did last night like we will tomorrow we all get together as houses called by God's name and the anointing the pure righteous incredible anointing that has to flow in a space like that when we fully understand and appreciate what being called a house, called by God's name means, that anointing, I think, is something that the church has yet to experience. That is something that the church has yet to experience. Everything that we have experienced in the Lord, everything that the moves of God throughout the church, throughout the ages, this anointing, when we have grasped this revelation and it has sunk deep down inside of us, that we are not just, we don't just blithely say, my body is a temple of the Lord. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is true. It says that in the scripture. But when we take that one step further and we say, my body, my body is a house called by God's name. Disease, you have no place here in this house called by God's name. Liver, you have to function in this house called by God's name. Spiritual senses, you, you must be, you must be alive because you are in a house called by God's name. Your body is a temple, absolutely, absolutely. But even in the, even in the world people say that, 
Even in the world, people talk about their bodies being a temple. But a temple for what? And a temple for who? My temple is a house called by God's name. And when I stand in church, and then I, I, and by church I, I mean a gathering of believers, a gathering of believers. When I stand in a gathering of believers, no matter where I am and no matter what it looks like and no matter who they are, and I say I am free, I can know that I am free because I'm choosing radical obedience and doing the will of the Lord. So, you can see that those verses from Mark, that story about Jesus tipping over the tables, there is so much more to it. God was saying so much more than we actually grasp with what happened there. Okay, I could go on and on, but I'm not going to. Our time is up. So I want to bless you all. I love you all. Clean hands, pure hearts, good house that is called by God's name. Let us ascend the holy mountain together. I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible tomorrow morning. It is going to be epic. It is going to be epic. Love you all. Bless you all. See you on Monday at 7 a.m.